So the six week, the first six week onslaught of the PA Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, has finished. The foundation has been established, and now the period of organizing has begun. I feel as if I've come through a tsunami that lifted me up and deposited, deposited me back where I was, except that so much that looked lovely to me before has been exposed, and what I now see is the cost of the glamour to those least able to afford it. I came to the campaign with an invitation and no clear understanding of what my role might be. I've been following William Barber for years, and when I read about the Poor People's Campaign, I knew I wanted to be a part of it. I didn't know what that meant. And over these past six weeks, I, learned, I both learned more about the movement, and as I worked to carve out my own leadership, more about myself and about my convictions and my faith. It's been an incredible privilege and one heck of a ride. One of the explicit goals of this movement is to change the moral narrative and to place the right of interpretation back in the hands of the poor and the dispossessed. In seminary, we would have called this liberation theology. We had fancy words that took me ages to learn, but what it meant was that we, the wealthy, didn't get to tell the poor what the Bible said. They got to tell us. And for those of you who are wondering why Pope Francis in some ways is such a breath of fresh air, it's because he comes out of this liberation theology movement. Now, in a more secular way, we are saying the same thing. And we're helping ourselves to understand that almost one half of our country lives in poverty or one circumstance away from it. Even people living far above the median income are often living large enough that there's no margin in their lives for error. They often confuse themselves with the poor. They are not. Now, for the first time, organizations made up of the poor and those working around issues that concern the poor are now joining hands and working together because the poor don't need us to speak for them. Unfortunately, they need us to shut up and listen, which is not always our strength. <laughs> Homeless coalitions, people with incarcerated family members, unions, the sick and disabled, the working poor, mothers, veterans, immigrants, religious outsiders are joining together to make their voices heard. They're risking what little they have to become visible, to tell their stories, and to claim their place in the narrative. And so often, we're not interested in, in hearing what they have to say. We just, and you know, I'm so grateful for all of you, we've just um, heard from the people down at Line Mountain who are starting a um, lunch program and, uh, or a backpack program, and uh, we've raised the $5,000 it will take to support their, to match their program. They've raised their $5,000. We're ready to give them a check. Um, we heard from the, uh, the guy who has been sort of spearheading this, and he took very good m notes at the last meeting. And one of the groups that decided not to participate did not participate because all of the children's parents were addicts, they steal their food, and they binge eat. And it's easy and convenient to think that. It's difficult to understand that the working poor are often hungry and don't have enough, especially in the last week, to feed their children. And even if that were exactly true for every parent in the world, don't the kids need the food anyway? And um, I love that we have been so committed to the notion that every child needs the food. 
Martin Luther King Jr. said, the dispossessed of this nation, the poor, both white and Negro, live in a cruelly unjust society. They must organize a revolution against the injustice, not against the lives of the persons who are their fellow citizens, but against the structures with which, through which the society is refusing to take means which have been called for and which are at hand to lift the load of poverty. The only real revolutionary, people say, is a man who has nothing to lose. There are millions of poor people in this country who have very little or even nothing to lose. If they can be helped to take action together, they will do so with a freedom and a power that will be a new and unsettling force in our complacent national life. And it was for that that he was killed. I began to hear in my sojourn from people I marched with, stood with, ate with, slept on a church basement floor with. You know I have to be conv convicted if I'm going to do anything that resembles camping. Um, but I began to hear stories of lives from which I am sheltered and protected. They entrusted these stories to me. They asked me not to speak for them, but with them, and to see myself as part of the impoverished to understand myself as part of the movement, not merely a facilitator. I come to this movement. This is my clergy drag, I want you to know, for the weeks that I've been there, except the last week when it was 90 and I didn't think I needed an extra scarf to keep warm. But um, I and many of my clergy colleagues have waited a lifetime for this movement and this moment. I am so grateful that my childhood minister, now in his mid-80s, still writes me to exhort me to action on this campaign. But as I stayed, I have been. I am being changed. I watched the people coming week after week at very great expense, who came because this is the first time they have seen hope. I find my hope with them but understand that my hope must look like theirs. It must look like health care, affordable housing, education, jobs, and fair wages for everyone. But before the hope, or perhaps just alongside of it, there are startling revelations I have not wanted to know. People piece lives together from the smallest scraps. They don't have what they need. And in fact, it is one of the reasons, Marie has said this forever, it is something we continue, it's one of the reasons this yard sale is so important, that people can get what they need at prices that they are sometimes able to afford. And if a couple things go out the door, <coughs> people get what they need. It is, as you would say in Hebrew, a mitzvah that we are doing here. But in addition to not having can openers or pots, they don't have access to things like food, housing, education, or health care that would transform their lives and enable them to fully participate. We live in a world that's criminalized being poor. We now have private prisons that are set up to their debtor prisons and people who can't make their... Um, Payments on their credit cards are being sent to jail where they will never. And it doesn't absolve their debt. It just grows while they're there, not earning money. But as the chant, I made, I did so many chants. I have never been a chant girl. I am now, you know, pretty much a chant girl. But as the chant goes that we said all of the time, being poor is not a crime. Poverty is the crime. Our society is built to ensure that there is not enough for a great many people, a truth that is covered over with a promise that if only they fill in the blank, do something, they could play too. But the deck is stacked 
against them. The poor are disproportionately affected by racism, ecological devastation, and the war economy. These rallies gave faces to those things we all know. They are overburdened by educational debt as well as by regular debt. They are not healthy and they are not safe. They are at greater risks of their lives and marriages falling apart. And when we hear those statistics, although actually I don't think they're that different, when we hear those statistics about you know, those darned single families or broken up families and that's why people are poor, it's they're not wealthy enough to stay together. They don't have the ease of, you know, and sometimes the stress of not being able to provide doesn't help you be a good partner. It makes you embarrassed and ashamed and makes you leave. But they're at risk of losing their children, of not getting the appropriate care in the system because they pay far more than those of us who can get insurance. I participated in a fundraiser to help a woman to have a dental procedure because if she didn't have a $700 procedure, she was going to die. And teeth are not covered by Medicaid. For want of a particular stitch, a life would be lost. And I posted on Facebook the other day, I don't know how many of you saw it, but they were saying, talking about politically, it always has seemed that the, as we become older, we become more conservative. But in fact, what they figure is that like a large number of t people die for lack of food, lack of insurance, lack of needed things before they get older, who might have carried more um, liberal points of view, of societally liberal points of view about things. <coughs> so in the course of this, I made a new friend by the name of Willie. I can't tell if the 31 after his email name is an indication of the year he was born or is the number he wore when he played for the Bills. Willie has been an assistant vice principal, a teacher, an outreach worker for the United Methodist. Methodists. He's cur currently living in Somerset, PA. He's talked over time about the feeling that God has led him to be in Somerset, where he can go for days never seeing another person of color. He's lonely for his people, but he feels he's there to teach and to give, even if it means having people point and stare and, at, and stare at him. As many, as so many of those of us of liberal religion, I have, I often have a somewhat knee-jerk reaction to the notion that God puts a hand on us and sometimes shoves to place us. And yet, there's Willie in Somerset and me in Harrisburg. And more and more as I was with this crew, I realized that in some ways this campaign is the culmination of everything I was taught from my earliest years, which is that God loves all the people of the world. This I always believed. Barry and I used to laugh when his Sunday school, well, it was bitterly, but when his Sunday school's teachers wrote to say to him, if you just repent, you don't have to be gay you can turn around and God will love you again. And we were very clear all those years singing Jesus loves the little children, we believed them. Never sing those songs if you're not willing to back them up. And you know when you stand, when I stood in that place and listened to people's stories, I hear that song which you know is trite and stupid and spot on. The first weeks we were with, we spent with Willie. He taught our band of 12, and actually I guess I didn't say this before. The thing that I chose to do and um, worked very hard at was being a peacekeeper. And that meant that my, I had a two-fold job that was to keep the people within the circle safe and focused on the speakers. And if there were hecklers or other people to turn around and try and dissolve that. It was, I was very happy that we were inside the rotunda so there weren't a lot of room for um, hecklers with bats. That made me happy. I worry how I would respond, you know. Um, 
but we are also to stand between the people who are, um, as they call them, arrestables, and make sure that they are safe and that nobody's escalating as the police arrest them. Um, so that was my job while I was there, and eventually it turned out that the guy who was supposed to be in charge left for three weeks, so I was in charge. And you all know my great abilities at organizing. Um, but he taught us so much about being successful peacekeepers. But it seemed odd then that after a constant presence at the rallies and a real joy at being in our company, he wasn't there one week and then another. And then this last week, we heard Willie was not with us because he's been refusing, re receiving death threats because of his work with Put People First and Poor People's Campaign. I complain, as I do, because my back hurts or my knee hurts. He's not complaining, and he's in mortal danger. And then he finally reached out. He friended me on Facebook and put a video of a tiny little black girl, maybe seven, maybe nine, standing in a witness box at what was perhaps a city council meeting, crying and telling us why it hurts that people hate them because they're black and how they need their parents with them, not in cemeteries. When she falters, a voice cries sternly from the crowd, you finish your speech, you keep talking. And you think about how at the first moment when our children fall over, we rush and pick them up and coddle them and they know they, they don't have that. And so this little seven-year-old wipes her nose and stands there and continues to tell us why racism is wrong. No coddling. Why coddle a child who is in grave danger of losing her loved ones? I know what Willie meant when he left that for me. It said, I trust you, Anne. I trust you, Reverend Anne. And there were times, and he differentiated between calling me Anne or Reverend Anne. And, it would, and he calls me that when he has a point to make. Willie holds me accountable. It feels like an incredible privilege, but a huge onus. This will be an increasingly awkward and uncomfortable time for those of us from the dominant culture. We will not be able to ignore the stories and stay true to who we are and what we believe. Many of us will be compelled to do things we have never imagined. I think of earlier days with my parents. Betty and Sam had never, heaven forfend, participated in any sort of political rally. But then a cross was burned on the Bloomsburg College campus, university campus. <laughs> I'm sure it was Betty who got Sam out of the house to stand. And you may blame them, if you must, for my behavior. I made it through six weeks of not being arrested because I had this other role to play. I was a peacekeeper. And through this time together, we grew surprisingly close. And although we did not have to push back against the hecklers, as I said, we have had to protect those taking direct action, not from the police who were arresting them and trying as hard as they could not to, because who wants to do paperwork, but from some folks with misguided privilege who wanted to start fights, endangering the, as they called themselves, arrestables. I fell in love with this crew as I found meaning in the work. We built a strong and effective team. But I cannot be sure that more will not be asked of me because there is so much more need and because people like Willie need me to give witness. Here at home, so much of the poverty and discrimination is rural and fairly well hidden, well enough hidden that we don't need to look too closely. But this national call for moral revival compels us to look. Our role will likely be as facilitators and providers of space and nurturant. It may be as protectors. There are people, they're talking, there is talk about an underground railroad starting up to take people to safety in Canada because America is not a safe country. It's 
hard to hear. There are people in our region to be organized, but we're probably not the best people to do that. Nijmi, who's a Pennsylvania lead, points out that wealthy white people cannot really educate poor folk of any color or organize. So the jobs left to us are not glamorous, but they're necessary. I was so impressed by the great job one of the guys from the Harrisburg UUs did organizing local churches to provide housing and food for the rallies. Three churches offered space, at least ten churches fed us. People did what they could. Sooner or later, this movement will come to our neighborhood. Do we want to be part of it? What do we gain if we do? What do we lose if we don't? Right now I'm spending a fair amount of time grappling with the consequences of my for the consequences to my faith and my very self if I don't continue this work in some way. <clears throat> There's so many people in our region who are un or underemployed, un or undereducated, un or underinsured. Their housing and food sources are precarious. The Poor People's Campaign is not asking us to solve those problems, but to stand with people and provide the support as they solve them. Certainly the work we do with the Love Project, Let Our Valley Eat, is important. According to ancient traditions, the role of the summer solstice is to exp expose what is kid hidden when you think of the things coming to light right now, it may be simply coincidental, but there's so much to look at. And the more I look at it, and the more I talk with friends, we realize that there are some serious shell games going on, that we're looking at this so they can do that. And we probably need committees of people to look at issues of justice and each one of us select one thing and not everybody try and look at anything because your eyes just go around in your head. Um, and we probably need someone in the middle who's completely Machiavellian and cool-headed to plot the whole thing on an um, Excel file and that isn't me. Um, <laughs> We need to see, we need to connect the dots, we need to plan, and if we're willing, we'll be called on to act. These are not only political issues. They are fundamentally moral ones. Who do we want to be as individuals and as a, as a faith community? It's an incredible opportunity to think through this, and I think we'll dovetail nicely with the fulfilling call process we're going to undertake this fall. This weekend, all my new friends headed off to Washington. I had long ago promised the river keeper to bless the Loyal Sock, the PA River of the Year. I love that Carol asked me to do this, yet I so wanted to see what would come with this march. And I wanted to be with the people with whom I had been learning so much. I am simply filled up with chants and songs from these days in Harrisburg. But yesterday, Carol talked in front of the head of Department of Parks and Rec and the head of the Worldwide Water Keepers Association about the support that UUCSV provided her organization when we helped six prisoners put their feet in what in pond or in creek water for the very first time in their life. Our thousand dollars that we raised changed those people's lives forever and turned them in that week into citizen sci scientists. And there was the same amazement when I spoke at the Clean Water Conference. People are beginning to realize that small communities like ours can be wonderful allies in supporting cleaning up the environment as well as changing the moral narrative. As I said, I participated with great pride the other day as Taylor engineered a press conference to introduce religious, spiritual, philosophical for a proposed non-discrimination ordinance in Lewisburg. You would have been so proud of him. He was there in his suit talking from the, you know, it, he looked great. Ed and I were there in clergy drag. We looked, we looked very spiffy ourselves, if I say so. Um, but when it came time to read the atheist statement, our participant had not arrived, so Ethan Ron read it. And then we went over to stand against the separation of children, and more of our kids and adults were there. 
I'm deeply proud and deeply hopeful for them and for our world. It isn't easy. For any of the goals we're looking at, success is a very long process, and our parts, while crucial, are small. I do think we're being realistic. Change like this is slow and difficult. But as William Barber said the other day, the first victory is when we know we're going to change. It's easier after that. Now we just need to decide what change will look like. The world needs us. Our valley needs us. Heaven knows those children need everything we can give them. I believe that we are here and ready to go. It seems like the time is now. This last week in Harrisburg, we learned to sing. We are a new, unsettling force, for, and we are powerful a new, unsettling force, and we're here. We are a new, unsettling force for liberation, and we have nothing to fear but our chains, and we have nothing to lose but our chains. They're the words of MLK and the words of Maya Angelou. They're powerful, especially sung by so many voices and sung in that rotunda and in the halls with those little rotunda echoed harmonies, fabulous. But what I remember most is when we were practicing, hearing a little voice, a three-year-old voice singing at the top of her, her lungs, I knew unset a wing force and we are powerful <laughs> and a new unset a wing force for liberation <laughs> and I thought maybe just maybe we really have nothing to lose but our chains <laughs>